For me, introducing myself very briefly, I'm a performance coach based in England. I've been over here since 1998 on my two-year OE. Um, I originally came over actually as a lawyer. I was a partner in a, in a city law firm and then had a career change about 10 years ago to become a performance coach. And as a performance coach, my job was working with leaders, CEOs, uh, head coaches in sport, quite a diverse range of environments, trying to help them figure out what's the optimal environment we can create to get the best performance from our team. That's really what it's about. And then last year, um, I'd written a book called Belonging, which was published. And I think it's one year anniversary is next week. Good morning, everyone. My name is Angela Kearns. I am a partner in the international law firm Clifford Chance, specialising in all things real estate sector. Uh, we're not in the office. I am mum to a six, four and one year old. So there is one way to describe my home life and that is chaos. And uh, like Owen, I came over in 99 and I'm now in the 23rd year of my two year working holiday. <laughs> always been in London, always based at Clever Chance. And it is my absolute pleasure to meet Owen today. I've been really excited about meeting him. Um, I've read the book. I'm now on the second reading. Um, and I have to say, it's really made me think differently about not just how I go about things, but also how we as an organisation might do things differently and perhaps for the better. So I'm going to kick into some questions. Um, I was going to ask you, Owen, first of all, obviously strong ties to New Zealand, but what, what keeps you here? Why have you been here so long? Um, well, I've married an English uh, girl, so that's a part of the reason. We went and spent a couple of years in New Zealand, living in the North Shore, I think 2016 to 18, and that was her OE, her two-year OE, but she did want to come back. But I, I actually wanted to come back as well. Uh, for the work that I do, it is much better to be placed up here than placed in New Zealand. And uh, I tr work with teams all around the world, and but particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. So I I'm very happy to be here. I, I think I mentioned in the book, you know, you can have one, more than one place of belonging. I've got a very deep spiritual connection to Southland, where I grew up, but I've also to Milford on the North Shore, where we had beautiful time as a family. I've got a very spiritual connection to the Cotswolds, where I live, and the people there and the experiences we've had there. So I'm very happy to be in any of those places. Great. And I want to come on now to being a performance coach. Because I have to admit, when I read the book, I assumed that perhaps Owen's background was in psychology or something along those lines. So I was really interested to talk to Owen this morning and find out that he was actually a lawyer to start off with for, for a long time and had a really successful career. And I wonder if you could just talk us through the transition and how you came to moving from being a partner in a law firm like my own to working with some of the most elite teams in the world. <laughs> well, it was quite unintentional. Um, actually, when I think back of when I was a little boy, I think I was always a bit of a coach. Um, I wasn't the bossy one, the alpha, but I was the one who was trying to organise people around me and, and constantly trying to get things done properly and done well. In the weekends, I'd be the one to call everyone up to go down to the local um, park to play cricket. And then when we were playing, if kids were mucking about, I'd try and get order to it. So I think I was always a bit of a coach. When I became a lawyer, I had a deep passion for it. I would still be very happily a lawyer. I didn't leave it because I didn't enjoy it. I, I loved it. Um, but actually, when I think about it, I wasn't a technically brilliant lawyer, to put it mildly. Um, I was more a coach, actually. So I think that identity has been part of my whole life. So I, th I think I was good at coaching a client. I was an employment lawyer, and it was you know they're all very stressful. It's hard. It's emotionally um, exhausting. There's so many decisions to make. So many, so much consequences. The legal stuff was fine, but I think I was quite good at just coaching them through a very anxious part of their life. And trying to, you know, I didn't have one case that went to a full hearing and in 12 years of being a lawyer over here, and I was proud of that. Um, 
And I, was, I think I was also reasonable at coaching the, the more junior lawyers into becoming a better lawyer. Uh, the, the crossover into performance coaching was just purely by accident. I'd, Adidas were reviewing their sponsorship of the All Blacks, and um, they'd asked Saatchi and Saatchi to help them. Saatchi and Saatchi was led by Kevin Roberts, who was a global CEO in New York. Uh, Kevin basically decided that he'd put a little Kiwi Mafia together to do this project. <laughs> and even though it had nothing to do with the law, he invited me to be part of this team who would help Adidas. And Adidas were happy with the sponsorship, but they still felt at arm's length from the All Blacks. They could see the magic and the spirituality and all these things, but they didn't really feel they got to know it much better over a 10 year period. So my job was to, uh, you know, I suppose with my Maori background and my interests was to try and articulate a little bit about um, the spiritual ideas behind the All Blacks culture. So I, went and I knew the coaches because I'd done some work with them as a lawyer and they allowed me to go into the environment and just sort of listen to them and articulate the ideas like whakapapa and mana. And then I read it, relayed that to Adidas. And, you know, interestingly, their global CEO, when he read the report, contacted me and asked me to go out and meet him one-on-one. -on -one. That's how interested they were in all these ideas. Then I came back to London and kept to do my lawyering, and I had a phone call the next week from Chelsea Football Club saying, we've heard from Adidas that you're an expert on team culture, <laughs> which was complete BS, obviously. But I'm said, of course I am. I'd be delighted to come and talk to you. <laughs> well, it's... it's, it's, it's so I, I explained I wasn't, but they said, look, it's very hard to find people who can help navigate us through thinking about our culture. Could you help us? You know, like they didn't have any other options. So I helped them. A couple of months later, the South African cricket team said, we've heard that you're the guy around culture. So I went down to South Africa and had a 10-year relationship with that team. Um, and then NATO approached me the following year, and then Manchester City approached me the following year, then the England football. So it's gone on like that. So I don't have any qualification whatsoever for what I do. Um, but I actually think that is an advantage because we were talking about this earlier. I think you find it in the corporate space now. Everybody knows all the buzzwords. Everybody knows all the management speak. Everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. But I think people are lost and confused about how you actually bring it to life. And I think conservative organisations like the FA, um, NATO, I work with the global leadership team of Accenture at the moment, I think they are looking for some different ideas and some of the Polynesian ideas and some of the spiritual ideas, they will go there. They will go there because the policies and these other checklists aren't working. That's, it's really fascinating to hear that just that whole, the whakapapa and the Maori culture and things from you know, such a small country on the other side of the world is having such profound effect on some of these organisations and their way of doing business and their way of thinking. Um, I wonder if it's worthwhile for the audience just reminding everyone what whakapapa means. Um, well, I've obviously read the book, but I did need, after so many years out in New Zealand, a bit of reminding. And then perhaps we could pick up about how you then apply that concept of whakapapa to your work with all of these elite teams. Well, uh, you know, I can only speak from my own understanding of whakapapa, but I think it's the most powerful expression of belonging, really. Um, I learned about it. My father died when I was five, and, 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 and he was part Maori and part English, and... Um, when I was 12, I wrote to Naitahu and asked them what they could tell me about where I come from. And they sent me this, some beautiful letters. You know, 25 generations of my ancestors from Paikia all the way down to my father. They explained that this is an expression of whakapapa. And as I l listened to them, what I understood was that what they were articulating was that each of us are part of an unbreakable chain of people that goes all the way back to our origin story. And this can be any community. It's not just family. It can be any community. Clifford Chance, the England football team, any community, any group. There's an origin story, and then there's a line of people with their arms interlocked with each other. And they are unbreakable bonds. And that not only comes through to us now, but it comes through to everybody who's going to follow us. And so this line of people... Our ancestors, ourselves, and the people who come after us have always been here. 
And the metaphor is simply that the sun first shone on our first ancestors and has slowly moved down this line of people. And the sun will reveal each of us in turn. And literally the sun is shining on us right now. It's our time. And But the sun is always moving. There's an impermanence. And great cultures are ones where our purpose, our identity, our values, our rituals and traditions are actually transmitted and passed down this line of people. So that when we are having the sun on us, we feel we're a guardian of this culture and we have a duty to uphold it and actually mend the bits that need mending. And then we have an obligation to pass it on to those who come after us. But we have also an obligation to try and create the conditions for them to thrive in, just as you would with your children. Um, and so these are very different leadership con concepts that most people are brought up with. But there's a huge appetite to understand leading people in a, in a way like that. It um, explains the all-black adage of no one being bigger than the jersey and handing the jersey, mm. always leaving the jersey in the best place when you move on from the team, right? Yeah. Yes. Built on those, built on those fundamentals. So why is why is this whole sense of fuck up? Why is this sense of belonging so important to the success of any team? Well, actually, uh, people are surprised sometimes when I explain that. Is that uh, these are powerful ideas? They are spiritual ideas. They're emotional ideas. But actually, from a performance point of view. What we're trying to do is we're trying to harness the energy of a group of individuals so they can perform at their best. And what happens is that when an individual comes into an environment, and this is not just an elite team, this is any of us in any environment, you will feel a natural sense of anxiety. And that emanates from this evolutionary need to belong. You know, for 99% of human history and probably 100% of human history, if you did not belong to a group of people, you would not survive. And so over time that became hardwired in our biology. So when you went into a group, you have this nervousness and stress and even adrenaline because you have this innate fear that you might be rejected and pushed away, which would be death for most of our history. So that is still natural. So when, a, when someone comes into a new working environment or a new sports team, they will have that anxiety. And when you're feeling that anxiety, it can be absolutely exhausting, as we all know. Uh, you are leaking energy through your stress, your cortisol, all of that. And you're feeling like an outsider. You're feeling like people are looking at you and judging you and you're waiting for them to say to you, um, it's okay, you can relax. And in the meantime, not only are you leaking energy, but you behave differently when you're in a highly stressed state. If you don't understand the game plan or what, what's being instructed, you're hardly likely to put your hand up and say, sorry, I don't, I don't understand, I need clarity. You're less likely to do that when you're in that state of not feeling you belong and feeling like you just need to fit in. Whilst if you have a strong sense of belonging, you're much more likely to be vulnerable and say, I actually don't exactly understand what you're asking of me, or I need some skill uplift in a certain area. So it's not only you know, leaking energy through emotional exhaustion, it is the specific types of behaviours we're looking for in people. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that when we have a team, we have people in a hormonal state where, where the cortisol levels are managed and oxytocin and dopamine, these hormones which really bring the best out, energise us but also drive certain behaviours. We want to make sure that they're present. So when we, with England football team, we have a very clear understanding of our whakapapa now. And I also worked with the British Olympic team last year and we did the same thing. When people hear the story of who they are and where they come from, and particularly when you highlight the diversity of, of the team and people like them having been in the team, it, you can literally measure it. If we did a, a blood test, you would measure their cortisol levels come down. Their, level, their oxytocin and dopamine levels will increase. So it's actually very scientific and biological about what we're trying to do. It's not just we have these nice ideas which make us feel nice. We're actually trying to influence the hormonal state of our athletes because there is, you know, interestingly, the All Blacks did this about 10 years ago. They got endo endocrinologists to come in and look at the hormonal profile of an All Black team over a week and they commented that the stress levels, cortisol levels were far too high and we're exhausting the players before a Saturday. So that's why they brought in um, things like a social on a Wednesday night, 
Um, they also told the coaches to stop shouting at them early in the week because it was a, it was causing an adrenaline um, surge and and releasing testosterone. So actually, and it's the same. We talk about legal environments. Somebody can fundamentally change your hormonal state on a Monday morning through an ill-conceived comment or poor feedback or whatever, and that can put you in the wrong hormonal state for the rest of the week, if not longer. So now with leaders I coach in business, we have a real intention, is that no matter how what we're feeling about things, what is the optimal hormonal state for that person to be performing in right now? And that can really, really change the way they give feedback and the type of conversations they have with them. Wow, so it really isn't just a psychological thing, it's a no. biological, medical thing. That's, that's really fascinating. I but think that's going to be happening in the future more that businesses will have a, a, a hormonal profile that they are looking for in a team. Like it, we see an elite sport now. Um, so the All Blacks will do things 48 hours before a test match to release testosterone. The more aggressive training, language, etc., will kick in there, very intentional. Um, and other teams are doing something similar. I think you'll find that in business. Um, and that, to me, we talk about burnout. That's a massive part of burnout is people just emotionally exhausted because they're in this hormonal state so much. And there's interesting issues really around women as well. I work, I'm on the board of Harlequins Rugby Club. And um, we've just started to work with a company who had done some work with some of the British athletes last year. And for example, the, some of their work shows that the week before you know, women, women menstruate, they have a 15 to 20% reduction in their energy levels. Now, a lot of women's sports teams are coached by males who are completely clueless around any of this. And so you know, they can be very critical and really tough on them and not understanding what's going on and the training and, the, and that. So we have to completely break through all that. And we, and we are doing that, and there's some examples. And that, so that's an example where now the coach understands this and is able to be a more intelligent and relational coach with those athletes because he's understanding their hormonal state is very different than a male different times. So I, I think we're going to learn more about it and we're going to get a lot smarter at it and we're going to stop burning people out by putting them in the wrong hormonal state for, for, in a chronic way. That's amazing. I, I mean, never mind male coaches that you know that. I just, <laughs> Didn't know that myself. <laughs> um, that's so. We're sort of we've focused so much in business on things like you know Myers Briggs personality testing and that sort of thing to bring their team teams together. But it sounds like we need to continue doing those sort of things to make sure you have a right mix in the team. But also look at more of this biological, medical side, social, uh, psychological, the psychological side of. Yeah, I've just learned something. I don't know about you guys, but I've definitely just learned something. Um, I want to pick up on culture. Um, because I think culture is a really big issue for businesses as we come out of COVID and everybody's been working at home for a couple of years and you hear business leaders talk about we need to rebuild the glue. We need to get our culture back. If we get our people back in the office, it'll all be fine. Everything, everything will come back to normal because what's missing is that we're not together. Um, and so I want to pick up on that because I'm sure it's an issue that are facing a lot of the organisations that people in the room work uh, for. And I guess my first question is, is that right? Do we need physical presence to rebuild culture? Yeah, I think I, I, I wouldn't um, assert that just getting physically together is the answer to all of our concerns around culture. There are plenty of teams during the lockdown who became a lot stronger, built a better culture, individuals felt more empowered felt and performed at a higher level when they were physically removed from people around them. There's people, plenty of people we can look out here who are going to go into their workplaces today and be around other people and feel they don't belong and feel in that chronic stress state. So it's, it's far too simplistic to say that we just need to get physically together and everything will be fine. That's, that's not it. The key things from my point of view are 
We have to have a relational culture. And also, sorry, there's also a mistake, like let's go back to what we had. No, let's reset what we were doing. That sort of assumes that everything was fine before. Yeah, which, which is slightly delusional as well, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, and it's also just looking forward as you know, like working with Accenture. You know, their number one strategic challenge is is the next few years is a war for talent. So you've got to have a promise of a culture that people want to know what the promise is, and then you're going to have to deliver it. So it's not just that you know we want to go back to anything. You, this is now going to be huge. If you, unless you want people just leaving for the highest dollar, you're going to have to build an environment where they'll stay. Um, you know, in high-performing sports, we would say that people would take a 30% discount on their market price to stay in a good culture. So that's that, the rest of the world is going to catch up with that. So for me, there's no shortcut or hack around this. People want to have a relational environment. They want an environment where the person who's responsible for managing them or leading them cares about them. As simple as that. <laughs> it's not complicated. And you can only do that if you have a relationship with someone where you know a bit about them, you know their story, you understand their personality, and you have a clear vision of what's required for them to perform at their best. You're just going to have to do that work. That's what great coaches do, and that's what's going to have to be replicated in the wider place. Now, some of that can be done completely online. You can have an amazing feedback and conversations with each other online. And I've seen it during the lockdown. There were some leaders and coaches who were brilliant at it. They said, hey, we never do this, but actually I'm going, let's have a one-hour Zoom chat. You're going to tell me your story. Because we've worked together for three years. I actually don't know your story. And other people would do the same thing. And I saw it, and they would say, I want you to tell me what are the things in our environment that hold you back. You, I want you to tell me. And then they would do visioning around what, what do you want to be doing in three years' time? You tell me. So I've seen leaders, do, that you don't have to be physically together. You can be physically together with people and never ask those questions or never be asked those questions. So or, or similarly, our story of who we are, the us story, what we belong to, you know, I had a, my law firm I enjoyed very much, but in uh, how many years was I there? 17 years or 15 years, whatever it was, there's never once an explanation of our founding story, our origin story, our first partners, why that firm was created. I, I found out subsequently actually the story, and it's really, really inspirational. It was never shared. Now that can be done in person, but it can also be done online. I saw a lot of teams create some beautiful, powerful videos of this is our story. This is the past, this is what we're doing now, and this is what we want to do in the future. So I, I think they are more important to be good at those things than whether we're physically together. If you can do both, great. It's not very British, is it, to ask people personal <laughs> questions? <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps that's why we, yeah, we as Kiwis point. do so well up here, because, I don't know, I'm from Christchurch, maybe it's a Christchurch thing, <laughs> but... We asked people what school they went to, don't we? I mean, we did it. We had that conversation yeah. ourselves earlier, and so it's about, I guess, for leaders taking themselves out of their comfort zone to ask those what some people might find quite difficult questions, but actually, we, perhaps we should think of as high gain questions, because actually, if you take the time to invest in your team, then you get hmm. such a reward back. I'll give you an example from from Gareth Southgate and the England football team. Because I don't want people to be thinking, oh, this sounds all nice and warm and but not, you know, not really performance-based. So when somebody will come into the England football environment, and this is completely replicable in a corporate environment, people will tell them why they're there. Why have you been selected? You think about it, when people come on their first day of work, how many people just sit them down and say, hey, thanks so much for coming, we're so pleased to have you, I want you to understand, you belong here. You didn't have to prove anything to anybody. You belong here. Those interviews were amazing. We had so many good candidates, but this is why we chose you. This is what we love about your experience. This is what we love about how you came across. This is how we think you can really add value to the team. How many people do that? It's not complicated, and but those good coaches like Gareth would do that. So when the person arrives, they're anchored in, you belong here, and it completely changes their hormonal state. Rather than spending a year, it's highly stressed, worried that people are going to either tap them on the shoulder and get rid of them. 
right from the start you feel like, okay, this is great. I actually feel like quite calm and relaxed here. I feel like they want me here. So he'll do that. And then the next thing is um, they will spend time a bit later visioning where they are today as a player and what they could become. So they'll do that. They'll, they'll, they'll vision. Now, again, in my legal experience, I don't think we were any good at that at all. You know, you come in here and obviously there's a ladder you go on, but no one was really visioning. This is a type of leader, lawyer you could become, you know, as a person, with clients, legally, what sort of things you're doing. Because it creates mental pictures which they both then commit to getting to. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when he's, where, where you get a payback for this is if a player is struggling and he has to give them feedback, he'll bring them over, he'll create a good space. First thing he'll do is ask them, how are you doing? How's your family? And he can ask that question because he friggin' knows about their family because he's asked, they've had their conversations and he knows the family. And, and in fact, for him, he's probably met most of them. So it's, it starts with that. And then the second thing he will do is to say, remember when you arrived, this is why we selected you. This is why you are here. This is why you belong here. So it anchors a conversation in that. And then the next thing he goes to is, remember that vision we created of where you are now and where you could become a world-class player? So it's all anchored in the re relationship and the conversations I've had. And then he will ask them, what's the gap between how you feel you are today and that potential that you could fulfill? And when the player is in that conversation, he spiked their oxytocin and dopamine, their serotonin levels, and they will be vulnerable and honest with them because he's earned the right. So to me, um, there's no reason why that doesn't replicate anywhere else in any group of human beings, from family through to any, anything else. Is that if we're relational and we do the work, then we can really, really help people get better and overcome problems they've got. I think that's right. I think that's completely right. And it's quite a neat segue as well into my other topic I wanted to pick up you today, which is diversity and inclusion, or d and I. I don't think there's hardly a pitch you or an RFP you receive in the corporate world these days that doesn't ask you to set out your credentials. And um, you talk a lot of, in the book about, um, you know, the troubles that the proteas had coming out of the Springbok era, and oh, sorry, the apartheid era, and then the All Blacks in, um, in 2004 and having to push the pause button and, and reset. And part of that, I th my understanding was, came from the fact that there was so much diversity in the team and it created differences. And then I sort of port that over to the corporate world and where we are today and everybody's sort of setting themselves targets to achieve um, for recruitment and retention. We're pushing the boundaries on gender pay gap reporting and extending it to things like social mobility reporting. And, and then you've got multinationals penalising their su suppliers by um, you know, imposing financial um, penalties for not meeting certain DNI metrics in their teams. And my question in all of that is, you know, which, we're, we're doing all of that to try to get more diverse teams. But then we've seen in the example like the Proteas and the All Blacks how when you got a really diverse team, it didn't quite work and things needed to be reset. So my question for you is, are things like diversity targets, financial penalties, really what the corporate world needs to be doing in terms of d &I? Are there other mm. ways we should be tackling this issue? Well, I like the way that you've made a distinction between diversity and inclusion because they're completely different concepts. Um, you know, I remember a really very powerful meeting with the South African cricket team in Stellenbosch uh, six or seven years ago where that is the most diverse team in world sport. I think on any, on any given day, their 11 players will represent six different cultures and religions. Um, and we went around and just asked people actually just to take some time out and reflect on the experience of being in this team. And it was incredible. The, the black players say, I don't feel I belong here. And why don't you feel like you belong? Because there's a quota 
and I feel that people are looking at me thinking I'm only here because of the quota. And then talk to the players of Indian ethnic origin and they said the same thing. And they were even saying that the only time they feel a sense of belonging actually is when they play in the IPL. Because there, they're there completely on merit. There's no question marks or quotas there. So just by having a diverse team does not make people feel included. They're, they're different concepts. So I personally don't have a problem with quotas in terms of accelerating diversity. Because I think if you just leave it to the natural process, in many cases it would just be far too slow. The people who have the power haven't got sufficient motivation to change. So I don't have a problem with that, but you've got to then create an inclusive culture. And for me, that again comes back just to the way that leaders behave. You know, the, one of the best captains I, I've ever worked with is a guy, Faf Duplessis, who was captain of the South African cricket team, when they were world number one for a long time. He continually was going into the environment, talking to everybody in that environment, um, getting them out for coffee, dinners on tour, all the time, and just asking them, if you were the leader, what would you change? What, what in our environment holds you back? What in our environment doesn't allow you to really be yourself? Like really easy, simple questions, but the answers he got from that were fundamental to the way he led the team. And a lot of changes were made because we inherited an Africana model of culture, which was very top-down. People aren't asked for their view. A very school teacher you're just told what to do, and if you won't do it, that's fine. You go, and we'll get someone in who will come in, right? No vulnerability, very, very, you know, stressful. And that did not suit a lot of people. Hashim Amla became the first Muslim captain, but his first experience with the team, he, 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 his, you know, his scoring was terrible, and he was dropped for a year. He, he couldn't be himself in that environment. It wasn't inclusive. He was being forced to fit into a prototype that didn't suit him. And that's part of it. I've, I'm working with a, a Accenture. We had a chat last week. MIT have got a human dynamics lab in the States which shows a 90% correlation between leadership teams where every single person has an equal, albeit quite a short, voice in meetings. And But how often do we go to partners meetings or other business meetings where there's dominated by three or four people? It's not inclusive. So there's actually good science and research coming out that's showing that that isn't it. So, yeah, for me, you, an inclusive culture isn't about policies or checklists. It's about really having a full commitment to build a shared experience, a shared identity, and not just replicating these very often conservative and cautious models of culture that have been inherited through decades giving everybody an opportunity to speak and really getting to know your team. And it's common sense. So really, it's when you so uncomplicated, back, isn't it, really? When you step back and think about it, it's just common sense mm. and common courtesy. But so much gets lost, doesn't no. it? And when I started with the England football team, actually, I asked players, uh, you know, I spent three months doing my sort of immersion, and I asked some of the black players, men and women, you know, like, what's it like playing for this team? And I remember one comment, which just goes to the heart of whether it's inclusive, was that in my culture, God has given, in my community, in my family, believe that God gave me this talent. And God gave it to me for a reason, which was to make the people I represent proud and to express it. When I come into an England environment, it is all about do not make mistakes. Avoid mistakes. Take the most cautious option. So I cannot be myself here. Okay, so that's an incredible, when you ask a question like that, I cannot be myself here. I have to fit in and basically be a clone of an Anglo-Saxon, Northern English person. And you know, give credit to someone like Gareth Southgate as he's changed the style of play fundamentally to allow everyone there to be able to play with tempo, play with their skill. I've been in meetings where I've heard him challenging them, take more risks. I will not jump on you if you turn the ball over, it's okay. They can't believe it, but it's taken time, and now the team plays with a different identity. So, you know, that's another very, very direct example. Um, sometimes people come from cultures where they hate everything, spreadsheets, KPIs. You know, I remember when I was a lawyer, first thing that comes on your screen is red or green in terms of your targets. Utilisation. Yeah, exactly. And for some people, actually, that makes sense, and that's fine. And for other people from different cultures, 
that is abhorrent and puts them in a high stress, high cortisol, adrenaline state for the whole day. And if you ask the questions of people about what they like or don't like about the environment, they might move to more qualitative answers. But if you don't ask a question, you're not going to have a good, really inclusive culture. Yeah, makes sense. I've got so many more questions for you. I'm conscious the audience will have questions as well. But just before I hand over, I just want to ask you one more question, yeah. personal question. And that is, you've obviously coped so many people to high performance. The book's out. Um, tell us what's next for you and what goals have you still got to reach? Um, what I, my absolute sweet spot is just being working with a group of people who... I care about and, and they value me and they give me a sense of belonging when I go in um, and uh, you know, I look to replicate that in different diverse environments from the Royal Ballet School um, I'm working with a film studio called Sister which has just been set up in the last couple of years uh, chaired by Liz Murdoch the three leaders of Sister are iconic women um, Stacey Snyder, who produced all Steven Spielberg's film, films. Jane Featherston, who's quite a legendary producer of TV series in this country. Um, so it's a, an intentional model to, to actually disrupt Hollywood and the way it's done in that industry by this feminine leadership. So it's a bit ironic that I, I'm being asked me to help them. But they've made me feel incredible sense of belonging and, and valued. And so that's really, really exciting. Because that's a completely different industry which is ripe to be disrupted in terms of behaviour and culture. So that, that's awesome fun. I'm really, really enjoying that. You know, I've got a very deep connection with the England football team. It's seven years now I've been helping them. We're getting better as we go. We've still got a young team. We've got a, a, an opportunity this year to keep pushing. And then we've got other opportunities after that. So I, I enjoy st you know, helping them. So it's not about big things. It's just about being a, with people that um, you know I feel like a sense of community with and go on a big adventure together. So I'm just looking forward to lots of adventures, really. It's all about the adventure. It is, yeah. It's all about the adventure. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. <laughs> it's really exciting. Watch the space, right? Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> I'm very lucky. Right. I'm going to hand over to the audience. There must be some questions out there. There seems to be still this persistent idea that building a great culture is different from driving results. It's complete nonsense. Do, you know, do people think that the pro tiers, NATO, the England football team have got me there to do anything other than win? So, uh, uh, you know, I hope in my book helps, but think, well, once we get on the same page that when we build a great environment for people, then they will perform at a higher level in an aligned way, then that question can fall away, hopefully. Um, when we've got people who are in a, a flawed environment where they are burning out, where they do not trust people around them, where they see a lack of integrity over here, where they see um, policies around sexual harassment, and then they see this person gets away with it because they generate so much revenue. What, what, once we understand that that is actually holding back performance, then, we're going to be, then we can actually mature and get into the proper conversations. But, and it was depressing listening to it because it was a big review of New Zealand cycling and they had high performance sport in New Zealand and they were still talking about, yeah, we want to do this, we've just got to make sure we keep the results coming. It's like, it, literally, if you, if you know the research, you've done the work, it doesn't make any sense. So if we can all get on the same page, let's build a positive environment great culture which will drive performance, then we'll start from there. The second point is the vision is very, very important because the vision delivers two things. One, it delivers a deep renewable source of energy because when you have a vision of what we're trying to do and it includes optimism, crucially, then it will generate dopamine and oxytocin in people. I mean, fundamentally what we're saying, like we were saying before, See this vision, we are going to go on a hell of an adventure in the next few years. This is going to be amazing. We're going to do it together. This is where we're going. And the other, so it's highly motivating, but the other thing it does is it creates powerful alignment. 
Because if we're all seeing similar mental pictures of what success looks like, then we're much more likely to be making similar decisions, navigating the terrain in a similar way than if we've got a great strategic document and no one can see exactly what the hell it adds up to. So actually in my work, I start with visioning. And again, with England football team, they had a, a KPI or a strategic objective was to be the best team in the world by a certain year. And so they invited me in to help them on the culture. And I said, I can see what you want to do as a KPI. I can't see what that would be like. And they said, what do you mean? I said, what's the mental pictures that go with it? So to their credit, they went. They, they said, okay, that's a fair challenge. So they went away. And a month later, I came back and they said, sit down there and close your eyes. We are going to play this style of football. We're going to have these type of people in our team. We're going to coach them this way. We're going to have this relationship with the public. We're going to have this relationship with the media. This is what kids are going to think when they see us. And all of a sudden, this big vision of what it could be started to emerge. And everyone, whatever your role, could see it. You could see all those things. And you could see how you could contribute to it. And by and large, that's come to life, the way we've... We play the, a connection with the public, a connection with the media, etc. So, to me, vision is absolutely everything. I've got it, and it's great that you're starting with that, attacking that. But the part of the vision has to be what type of experience and environment do we want to create? Don't forget that bit. And if we want people to burn out through having a traditional type of approach, then okay, <laughs> but we probably don't. But people are looking for ideas as to what that could look like. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Yeah. And so I, I'm a team coach. So, so the global leadership team at Accenture, I'm coaching the leadership team. So that's what I do. But what we want to do is create an experience and go on a journey together which will cascade down. So I'll give you an example. There's certain, certain things that we do now when people come into the leadership team. Um, and so we have rituals now. We, they are sent belonging cues. They are given permission they are told that they are equal with everybody else there. These things are said explicitly. Um, and there's a cascading that comes down. So the, the cascading can come down into their teams and then what they expect from people, and then below that and below that. So for example, on the first day, what can cascade down is on the very first day, someone comes in at quite a junior level. The CEO or so, someone as seeing as possible will come down and meet them, even for 20 seconds and say, welcome. It's amazing to have you here. You belong here. I want you to have a great experience. Then the next thing that happens is they sit down um, with the, the line manager, but also the people that interviewed them, and like Gareth would do, and just explain, hey, that was a hell of a, um, hell of a awesome candidates, but you stood out, and this is why. This is what we love about you. This is how we see you adding value to this team. And, and we want you to understand you're here for a very good reason, and you belong here. You don't have to prove yourself. And if you need anything, and if you need, don't understand anything, you just tell us, okay? Don't worry about that. So that, that thing happens. And the third thing happens is their peers who they're going to work with will get them in a circle. This is in the first hour of their first day at the most junior level. Their peer, peers will sit, put them in a circle, and they will just say, this is my role in the team, and this is a little bit about where I come from and how long I've been here. And then it comes around, and the new person will just say, well, this is my role that... I understand, and this is where I've come from, and it's not the whole life story, but it's enough, and it's sending these powerful signals of belonging, and to calm them, so that they're in a good hormonal state to be themselves and to start performing. So that is an example I've seen where that can be trickled down all the way. So, yeah, that's a big test of a culture as to whether it does transmit that way. But the ideas I'm talking about are applicable. To Everywhere. Well, yeah, again, I don't see any distinction between... Because all the things I've actually spoken about don't cost any money. That's the beauty of it. And I, again, this depressing interview I heard this morning was like, yes, but you know, we need more resources in order to create an inclusive culture. It's complete BS. It is about how humans interact with each other. So I do. I have worked with startups, and I love that. So with a startup, first of all, what we do is we create a vision of what we want to become. 
And what we put in the center of it is the environment and the experience. So rather than just allowing this to be some sort of adrenaline-fueled, crazy, you know, startup experience where people behave brilliantly and terribly and all that stuff, we actually have intent from day one. Like, this is where we want to go. We want this to break even, make a profit, have an impact on the industry, whatever it is. And this is the way we're going to do. This is going to get scary at times. It's going to get, you know, we're going to be under pressure. But let's have a couple of things that we buy into. Why don't we create an environment where everyone is kind? Let's, say, let, let's put that there. Let's put that as a value. Let's put three stones in the middle, and one will be kindness. So every single thing we do, do you want to do that? And when I'm saying this, it might sound mad. This is what I've done. I've worked with a startup film studio in the last couple of years. This is literally what we did. We identified those three stones. And everybody connected to them, held them, talked about what they meant for them, and, and they use that to navigate through the crazy experience of being a startup. So I think for them it was having edge, having heart, and being kind. And that they want all the work to replicate that. So if you create an, a vision of the experience we're going to have, and then it also creates a language to challenge each other. So if something goes bad and the ma manager or whatever behaves badly, then you're able to come back to that and say that, remember we talked about the our identity and our culture. Well, we didn't live it today, did we? So it becomes less personalized and more objectified because we've visioned out what it is that we all buy into. So uh, startups are beautiful because the origin story from the, of the whakapapa, you have so much power in curating it and shaping it versus a lot of teams I get invited in where the whakapapa is quite long and a hell of a lot of it isn't inspiring and a lot of it needs mending which is just a different challenge for the leaders with the sun on them. And one powerful example in New Zealand I saw of that was, I think some Polynesian guys my age have set up a, um, a network, which is that they love the whakapapa of where they've come from, from you know, Poly Polynesian. But the one thing that needs mending is domestic violence, is that there's so much amazing stuff, whakapapa, all these things, but there's also part of the whakapapa is it's been acceptable for whatever reason for males to harm their partners and their children in the house. And they've put their hand up and said, we're proud of our whakapapa, it's imperfect, and with the sun on us, that gets fixed now. And so projecting into, into the future, when we vision the future, and I, I, so I think that's a good example of corporates as well. It's not just celebrating, it's like what needs mending now? So the th it's a long answer, I apologise, but for a startup, you've got so much opportunity to shape and vision and create a really cool way of doing it, not just sort of scrambling in a chaotic way to try and break even. Well, the, the first thing is a lot smarter recruitment um, by boards and senior executives about who they put in leadership positions. Um, you know, there's an expression in sport is that the players know when the coach is in it for you and they know when they're in it for themselves. And I actually think that's a really very, very truthful. You are recruiting, you need to be recruiting people who actually have shown the capacity to put something before themselves. And you know, it's interesting, Jim Collins, good to great, wonderful book. One of the traits of the level five exec, which he expressly says was a complete shock, they weren't looking for it, was humility. And he, he says they, they actually fully expected that would not be a trait of a level five exec, it, but it was a fundamental over, you know, very, very powerful trait. And so that's, again, from a performance point of view, evidence in that, away from the hero style of leadership. So I think our tolerance is, hopefully, it's certainly in a corporate world, is reducing for the egotistical, this is all about me, I'm taking all the glory, any blame, someone else will take that, um, you know, alpha type of character. And I do hope that there are some models out there of different types of leaders. And, and in a small way, someone like Gareth Southgate actually, I think, has an influence on the wider community because he has no ego, he is not an alpha, he is not doing any of this for himself. He genuinely believes in the purpose of the team 
and has a vision with them about what would be a great legacy. And so hopefully those examples are uh, coming to the fore, but fundamentally clarity around recruitment. And we, at, I'm a, on the board of Harlequins, we um, recruited Tabai Matson from New Zealand to coach our team with absolute explicitness that we wanted a lead, the previous leader, very talented coach, but it was all about them. It's just exhausting for people. Um, didn't really want to share ownership. So we, we went the other way completely. We need a humble human being who cares about other people and we can demonstrate that and we'll share ownership with other people. So they're the three main things in this job description. That's where we start. And then the, you know, the rugby expertise and all the other stuff follows it. But start with that, not how many trophies I've won. A big part of that would be in the visioning part of it. So who, who, what do we want to become? And then making sure that is given full attention as part of that. that. That's how I would approach it. So it's all very well to say these things are difficult right now. Okay, let's move into the future. What, what's, what do we look like in the future? What do people say about us in the future? And I've ha I have these conversations with businesses where it actually creates a fundamental shift in them because they know that they want to be seen as a good citizen. They know that they want to be seen to contribute. They know that the war for talent will, rec will involve people who are coming in demanding a strong position on this and not even neutrality something much greater than that. Um, and so I've, I've watched that. I've seen the visioning play out. And then when the visioning is locked in, I'm sorry, my friends, you've got nowhere to go. You're going to have to make the changes now. I've seen that happen. So rather than attacking the moment and say, well, why don't we do this and that now, I think once they lock in and buy into the vision, then that forces the, the issue. I, that, I can only say that from my experience. Just one thing on the actually thing, the football thing. I was going to mention as well, and this is a broader thing for an inclusive culture. A couple of years ago, I was asked to go on a um, culture review of British gymnastics. Okay? And one thing that really, really was powerful, and, I, and I'd challenge us to think about this in any environment, was that it was all looked all shiny and fine, and they had Olympic medals and everything. Um, as it transpired, there were significant issues which had played out, and, and we reported on those. But anyway, at the end of that gathering, we spent about five days in that environment. There was something that wasn't sitting well with me particularly. So one of the administrators was in the, who was in the final meeting, I just asked her, I said, do you, excuse me if you don't mind me asking, have you got, do you have children? She said, yes, I do have a daughter. I said, okay, can I just ask you, would you be happy for your daughter to be in this program? This is after she had spoken up about how great it was for 20 minutes. And she just had this pause which went forever and then answered, no. I said, okay, well, can you tell me why? Because the way they're treated. Because I actually, they're just told what to do every minute of their life. Even holidays have to be approved by their coach. Um, they don't, they don't, they never communicate in this environment. They just listen and do what they're told. So compared to their peers who aren't part of this program, they don't have good communication skills compared to other 13 and 14 year olds because they don't practice it. They don't think for themselves. And, you know, it was a real shift happened. And I think we should think about that question a lot. Would we want our children in our environments? Would we want them to be managed by me? Would we want them to be managed by this person? And if not, why aren't we challenging them? The idea that human beings are somehow different, it's just nonsense to me. So it's one of the things I'd think about whenever I'm in an environment, is that how would my own children do here? And, and, and often when you go in, I'd say my children would not perform well here. They could not be themselves. They would be burnt out. They would be scared. And that would affect their performance. There's no, it's just interdependence. I just wanted to mention that as well. Like we don't, hopefully it's from today. We don't need to overcomplicate this stuff. The simpler the questions, the better. Well, I, I don't um, think, you know, you have to be from that nation to coach the team. I, don't, I think that's too simplistic. 
Um, what I do think is that you have to immerse yourself not only in the culture of the team but in the wider culture. You know, when I go into an environment, the Royal Ballet School, I spent six months just observing and listening before I gave them any advice. Um, Harlequins, when I did a review the season before last three months, being the football team, I spent four months. I'm not doing anything other than I spoke to like over 50 people going back five decades to try and understand. So for Brendan McCullum, that's what I'd recommend that he would do. I'm friends with Gary Kirsten, another very good cricket coach, and he explained that on day one with the Indian cricket team, who went on to win the World Cup, he gave this amazing PowerPoint presentation. He'd, he'd thought about it, he hadn't slept for nights, he'd thought about this amazing, and this is what the data, and this is what we're going to do, and this is all that. And he said, as he presented on his first day, very, very anxious, he said the players just stared at him. He said, any questions? Nothing. And he sort of, he walked away and he thought, well, that, that must have gone quite well. <laughs> <laughs> and Sachin Tendulkar, who was a captain, just went over to him afterwards, put his arm around him and said, my friend, just watch and listen for a few months and then do a presentation. And he did. And he completely changed how he approached them by just listening to them. So you don't have to be from the same country at all, but you've got to have a humility and an open-mindedness and open-heartedness to understand them and you know what it takes to get the best out of that group of people. Yeah, I mean, there's some great research which shows that people who perform under pressure are ones who focus on the controllables and turn the volume down on the... Um, things are outside the control. So one of the things I would always do with the team is we draw a circle and we've put in the circle these are the things that we can control or at least influence and then everything outside the circle. So if we're going to a World Cup, the media, social media, the weather, the refereeing, all that, we can't control that. So we put it outside the circle. It creates a discipline. We focus on the circle. And then, you know, when I'm talking about visioning, I'm talking about a deep focus on the things that we control, how we do them. Not so. Even when we go to a World Cup, we would spend very little time visioning holding a trophy, right? We don't we don't focus on that. Might not even be in it. Um, in the Euros last year, we talked about going on a seven-game adventure, and the seventh game would always be the final. So it's more focus on the things that we can control and having the discipline. But also, you need good leadership because I remember even when I was lawyering. There'd be so many things externally we couldn't control where the leaders would go on and on about, and it completely distracted and stressed people out. Okay, what we actually want is a calm, composed environment where we are very focused on if we do these things well, it'll be okay. So that, that's where I would always start from. And yeah, of course, there are external things that are going to affect us. Um, and that, that's where a good leader needs to be able to manage those, but try and influence them, but not pollute the environment by over-focusing on it. I'm going to wrap up there. Owen, <laughs> thank you so much yeah, for coming awesome, to talk to you. us today. It has been really, really quite inspirational. Um, just common purpose, visioning, asking questions, getting underneath the skin of your team and really understanding how they work as individuals. Are just a few of the sort of takeaways that I'll have, and I'm sure that everyone in the audience will have the same, and I'm no doubt more. So I just wanted to big round of applause, say thank you. Thank you.